Thank you very much, uh, Schengen, for these kind words of introduction and welcome to all. Thank you for dedicating some of your precious time to um, learn about what the human right to adequate food may contribute to the very purpose of uh, the Institute um, um, for um, uh, the, the Institute on, on Food Policy, um, um, the International Food Policy Research Institute, sorry, um, um, a world that is free from hunger and malnutrition. I'd like to um, begin perhaps by recalling that the right to food is not a new thing. As you know, uh, the right to food is um, a human right that is embodied in international instruments since the 1948 Universal Declaration on Human Rights. It was then reiterated in the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights in Article 11. It appears in other instruments, such as the Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, adopted in 1989. So it has a status in international human rights law that is well established and that does not deserve to be uh, commented upon at any length. What is important, however, is, the right, is that the right to food, although having this important pedigree and having this um, status in international human rights law since a long while, has really been only recently found to contribute to poverties to alleviate hunger and malnutrition and to the effectiveness of policies that seek to improve food security. It has been rediscovered. And I'd like to describe how it has been rediscovered by recalling some important dates, which today result in a situation in which the international community increasingly calls upon the right to food as one instrument, amongst others, to reduce um, hunger and malnutrition and one condition for the effectiveness of um, food security strategies. This new understanding of hunger and malnutrition is one that was based on the experience of our past failures. In the 60s and 70s, as you know, the fear of governments was that supply of food, globally speaking, um, would not be able to match with increasing demand. And many governments were fearful of the rates of demographic growth, of the rates of urbanization and shifting diets linked to that. And the result was that lots of energy was put into developing uh, and increasing food availability. And we succeeded pretty well, thanks to green revolution strategies in increasing the calorie availability per capita, in increasing um, the availability of food um, uh, by a variety of techniques that invested um, in developing the major cereals, um, uh, rice, wheat, maize in particular, uh, but yet the number of hungry people was not reduced significantly and even the proportion of hungry people um, was only slightly improved as a, as a result. And so there was obviously a problem. Our emphasis on increasing production, our emphasis on boosting supply to match with growing demand, our emphasis on technical approaches to combat food insecurity were failing. And that was the realization um, of the international community triggered by the work of um, Amartya Sen, the um, work in particular that he presented in 19, 1981, Poverty and Famines, an essay on entitlement and deprivation, where Amartya Sen was for the first time as clearly explaining studying the four great famines of the 20th century, beginning with the great West Bengal famine of 1943-1944, explaining that famine was not necessarily the result of failures of production, not necessarily the result of bad harvests. Famines can occur as a result of governments not being held accountable to their populations, as a result of certain groups of the population losing incomes and being unable as a result to purchase the food necessary for their subsistence without the government intervening in support of their purchasing power, allowing them to command the food that they need to acquire. The lesson of Amartya Sen was actually threefold. He was first of all emphasizing that uh, food security was not just about availability, it was also about access, about um, entitlements, about uh, 
the possibility that food producers must have to continue to produce food and the possibility that those not producing food should have to command food from the markets with a sufficient purchasing power. The second lesson of Amartya Sen was the importance of accountability. Governments held accountable are governments who cannot ignore the needs of their populations and who cannot um, remain passive in the light of uh, the spread of hunger, food insecurity. And so accountability mechanisms, democracy, a free, uh, free media, a vibrant civil society are all ingredients that contribute to reducing food insecurity as a result. And thirdly, Amartya Sen was basically obliging us to shift our perspective from one looking at the macro economic indicators, looking at the global levels of supply and demand, looking at um, production in comparison to needs, to looking at the situation of the poor families and asking why these families are left to fence for themselves, what are the obstacles they face, what could be done to support their access to food by adequately framed public policies. That was Amartya Sen's teaching in 1981. And it took some time for these teachings to percolate to the political level, but it occurred finally in 1996, when for the first time at the World Food Summit, the second of that name, the first one of course was convened in 1974, um, as a result of the very important spike in prices um, in 73, 74. But in 1996, for the first time, the World Food Summit convened in Rome, and the governments at the World Food Summit requested that the normative components of the right to food be clarified, and that greater attention be given to implementing the right to food. So basically what governments were becoming aware of is that the right to food might be um, um, an instrument, uh, a weapon against hunger, the usefulness of which has been hitherto underestimated and on which we could build more effective food security strategies. Based on this request from the World Food Summit 1996 and commitment 5.2 of the Rome Plan of Action that was adopted at this World Food Summit, the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, this body of independent experts who monitor compliance with the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, adopted a general comment, an instrument, a, a document describing the components of the right to food in um, 1999, um, general comment number 12, um, an authoritative interpretation of what the right to food means in international human rights law. And when the World Food Summit reconvened in 2002, World Food Summit five years later, um, it then launched a second process, uh, a process um, that would lead to the adoption by the FAO Council of the voluntary guidelines in support of the progressive realization of the right to food in the context of national food security, adopted unanimously on the 23rd of November 2004 by the FAO Council, following a two years long negotiation process within the FAO, all governments being involved in this process, um, that described uh, very clearly um, how governments should um, go about realizing the right to food, which are the different measures they should take in various sectors, such as food aid, development cooperation, um, agricultural policies, social protection. Um, these advances, very significant advances, were further confirmed more recently by the declaration adopted at the World Summit on Food Security convened in Rome in November 2009, where uh, governments committed to set the world on the path to achieving the progressive realization of the right to adequate food in the context of national food security. And the third of the five Rome principles adopted there refers to the need for governments to move towards long-term sustainable agricultural food security, nutrition, and rural development programs to eliminate the root causes of hunger and poverty, including through the progressive realization of the right to food. And the um, declaration adopted at the World Summit on Food Security in Rome in November 2009 then describes in paragraph 16 
uh, what this means, and it means essentially um, implementing these guidelines of 2004 on the progressive realization of the right to food in the context of national food security. So what I would like to do is try to describe what this means, what this adds. Is this useful? Is this symbolic? Or is it a condition for food security strategies to uh, achieve effective success? Let me begin by describing what the results of these developments have been, how the right to food came to be clarified about 10 years ago. Um, in 1999, with General Comment 12 of the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, in the 2004 Voluntary Guidelines in support of the progressive realization of the right to food. And the first comment I'd like to make here is that when the General Comment number 12 was adopted by the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, the committee adopted um, the framework of analysis proposed by a Norwegian jurist, Ashbjorn Eider, um, in the 1980s, when he worked on the right to food for the United Nations Subcommission on Human Rights as an independent expert. And he pre presented in 1987 this report, The Right to Adequate Food as a Human Right, that presents this framework that basically summarizes what is expected from states if they are to seriously discharge their obligations under the human right to adequate food. And this framework is a very simple one. It defines three levels of obligations for states. Uh, one obligation is to respect the right to food, and that means an obligation for states not to take any measures, not to adopt any action that leads to interfering with the existing level of enjoyment of the right to food. The second column here is the theoretical definition of the duty. The third column provides some examples. For example, if you evict a farmer from her land, her right to food is being violated. The state violates its duty to respect that right. If you destroy crops, you violate that right. If food aid is interrupted, um, the state is violating that right. And there are many other ways in which governments may be in violation of this elementary duty to respect existing enjoyment of the right to food. Secondly, states have a second obligation, which is uh, to protect the right to food by regulating private actors. Now, this means that private actors who have an influence on the ability for every individual to have access to food should be adequately controlled, regulated by governments to ensure they do not abuse their dominant position in the food chains, to ensure that they do not hoard food in times of crisis, leading prices to spiral on the markets, to ensure that employers pay decent wages to their workers, or that landlords um, respect the rights of their tenants who depend on access to land for their livelihoods. There are many different consequences that follow from this obligation to protect, but the basic idea is that the food systems should be regulated by states seeking information about who benefits and who loses from the way the food systems function, and the state should not remain passive it, if it turns out that some actors in the food systems are being left out, are losing, are being impoverished, and if inequalities are increasing. Much of my work as Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, um, which consists in providing the United Nations General Assembly and the United Nations Human Rights Council with recommendations as to how the right to food can make progress, much of my work has been focused on what states should do to regulate the food system, to, for example, use competition law to address abuse of dominant uh, buyers' positions in the food chains, uh, how to protect small ac smallholders' access to food chains, how to ensure that contract farming schemes are equitably framed to benefit smallholders. All this is a different um, if you wish, implications of the duty of states to protect the right to food by regulating adequately the private sector. Thirdly, governments have an obligation to fulfill the right to food. And that obligation is an obligation to um, ensure that markets function well by creating the background conditions that allow the markets to fulfill their function, which is to stimulate production, 
and to ensure adequate distribution and supply of food in accordance to needs. Unfortunately, in many cases, food does not go to the people who need it most. Food goes to those who have the purchasing power that allows them to afford them the food that is on the markets. And states must, therefore, adopt policies that increase the purchasing power of those who are too poor to afford adequate diets, that ensure that the markets function in a way that supports access to food for the poorest, and states must take steps to progressively realize the right to food um, in uh, situations where hunger, malnutrition are widespread. Um, they may even have to provide food to populations in need when the market is unable to supply food in adequate conditions. There is then a need for governments to step in in order not to leave populations starving, for example, in times of natural disaster, uh, droughts, floods, um, or civil conflict. In addition, we have defined in these documents I've been referring to the various components of the right to food, not in terms just of the obligations of states, but also in terms of what uh, the right to food actually consists in, materially speaking. And um, as Schengen Fan has already mentioned, the right to food is not just about availability, about adequate production uh, to meet changing demand. The right to food also requires that we pay attention to accessibility for the poor, for those who are um, uh, cut off from the markets, for those um, who are facing discrimination and for this reason cannot have access to the food. So beyond access availability, there's accessibility. There's also a requirement of adequacy. The right to food is a right to adequate diets containing the adequate micronutrients that uh, allow people to lead healthy and active lives. And there is finally a requirement uh, of absorption by which is meant that the calorie intake and even the uh, micro and macronutrients intakes may not be sufficient to guarantee or to satisfy the right to food if um, people are um, uh, struck with disease, if they are not well educated about how to feed themselves, um, they may, uh, as a result, not have adequate diets, even though they have plenty of food around and even though they have the purchasing power required. So these are the different components of the right to food, allowing governments to better understand what is expected from them. What is the most interesting here, I believe, is that the understanding of the right to food goes beyond describing the content of states' obligations <laughs> and what people have a right to. The right to food is also about setting up adequate governance schemes that will allow accountability to improve and accessibility um, um, for the poorest to food to be improved as a result. There is a governance framework that is gradually being developed and that um, is a way for governments to implement the right to food. This governance framework is one that's described in the general comment number 12 of the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. It's also one that is described quite clearly in the voluntary guidelines adopted in 2004 by the FAO Council. What does it consist in? It consists, first of all, in the adoption by states of national strategies for the realization of the right to food. Such national strategies are action plans, uh, multi-year action plans, but they are not simply policy instruments. They are plans that end up imposing duties on governments that they can only ignore or not comply with, um, with uh, a political cost and sometimes a legal liability being incurred. National strategies are essentially multi-year plans that can define actions to be taken over three, five, seven years that governments adopt in dialogue with civil society, in dialogue with producers' organizations, based on a mapping of food insecurity and vulnerability that identifies as a first stage towards adopting such an action plan, that first identifies who are the hungry, who are the malnourished, what are the obstacles they face, and what should be done to remove these obstacles piece by piece. These national strategies, thus defined, 
turn policy objectives, desirable things, into duties for governments. They are a way to coordinate the action of different ministerial departments, um, agriculture, employment, education, must all work together to implement these national strategies and to manage this complex process of achieving the right to food across different policy areas through this umbrella national strategy. There are a way also to ensure that these strategies will be um, funded adequately. In principle, these multi-year strategies should earmark the funds, um, ensuring that even though the governments may change, the budgets will always be made available for these strategies to be pursued over a number of years, thus creating a framework that will provide the right incentives for the private sector to invest in realizing the right to food. Fourthly, most importantly, these strategies define not just what should be done, but within which time frame different actions should be taken, whom should take which measures, whom is re responsible for what, so that if an action is not taken, it will be possible to identify responsibilities. It is this minister who has not acted. It is this department who has not uh, made the funds available. It is this branch of government that has failed to comply with its obligations under the action plan that has been agreed to. And ideally, these action plans, therefore, can be independently monitored, sometimes by courts, most frequently by other independent monitoring systems that are set up as part of this national strategy. A fourth advantage or fifth advantage of these national strategies is that they promote public debate. Governments shall develop these strategies through a dialogue with producers' organizations and civil society organizations, and the publicity given to the commitment of the government through this national strategy will make it much more costly for the government to renege on its promises or not to implement the plan um, according to what it promised to deliver. Sixth, the adoption of such a national strategy is a very powerful signal coming from the top. Um, that the government is intent on making food security a priority and that all sectoral policies should converge towards this objective. Very clearly, if you look at the successes of a country such as Brazil or Malawi, for example, in achieving success in combating food insecurity, much of this is the result of simple political will, strong signals coming from the very top of these governments that food security should be a priority. While adopting a national strategy that is cross-departmental is one way to press this message across a whole, the whole of the government. And finally, a national strategy that is a multi-year strategy is a way to mediate between the short term and the long term. In my view, one of the key challenges that governments are facing today is how to manage this transition from short-term imperatives to long-term visions. For example, it's very easy today for poor countries, net food importing developing countries, uh, that are food deficit countries, to, to continue to import foodstuffs from international markets at relatively low prices because heavily subsidized by OECD countries. That's the easy solution. That's what these countries have been encouraged to do since 30 years. But we know that in the long term, that is not sustainable, this increased dependency on international markets. The food bills of these countries that have spiraled out of control over the past few years, mul being multiplied by six since 1990. And we need to move, therefore, to a situation where these countries will rebuild their agricultural systems, reinvest in local agriculture to be able to produce for themselves, feed themselves, rather than being fed. That means that the short-term temptation to continue to import at low prices, at the risk of creating disincentives for their producers to produce, must take into account the long-term objective of regaining an ability to produce for themselves and to achieve an increased self-sufficiency. That means you need to plan the transition from the short-term to the long-term. Similarly, it's very easy for countries today to benefit from um, subsidies to you know, increase the use of fertilizers, uh, uh, pesticides in the fields, and boost production. 
But in the long term, the dependency on fossil energies that this will represent, the dependency on foreign technologies owned by northern-based corporations may not be sustainable, may reduce agrobiodiversity, may um, not allow small-scale farmers to thrive by practicing low external input and therefore less costly ways of farming. To move towards sustainable types of farming, you need to plan a transition and the short-term incentives governments are facing may not correspond to what is in their best long-term interest. So multi-year strategies are a way to manage this transition and to, um, uh, to move from satisfying the present imperatives to building solutions that will have chances of prospering in the, in the long term. Um, that is, I, I believe, one major advantage of these strategies to, to effectuate um, this transition and to avoid that governments shall always be held hostage to short-term concerns. These national strategies in an increasingly large number of countries since 2006-2007 have been adopted through an institutional framework that is defined in a framework law. So that's the legal component of the right to food. What is a framework law? A framework law is a law that defines according to which process a national strategy shall be discussed, set up, negotiated with civil society organizations and producers organizations, and how governments shall be monitored so that they don't deviate from the action plan that they have set for themselves. One example is the Brazilian law of 2006 establishing a national food and nutritional security system. The Brazilian um, law is one that sets up a body uh, that is called CONSEA, the National uh, Council on Food and Nutrition Security, that is composed of two thirds of its members of civil society members um, and one third of representatives of different uh, ministries involved in food security in Brazil. CONSEA makes recommendations to the government, and these recommendations are then studied by an interministerial chamber for food and nutrition security. This is a task force across the Brazilian government that links the Ministry of Employment with the Ministry of Agriculture, with the Ministry of Rural Development, with the Ministry of Social Protection, and so forth, Ministry of Education, and together, these different ministries adopt a national action plan that is valid for five years, based on the recommendations negotiated within CONSEA between civil society and government delegates. What are the advantages? The advantages are the national action plan shall be highly visible, and civil society shall monitor whether the government is delivering on its promises. The national action plan shall be informed by the views of the poorest, poor farmers, small-scale farmers, NGOs, those who work alongside the poor, the frontline human rights defenders who know often better than the technocrats from governments what the poor most need and which obstacles have to be removed. And thirdly, this national action plan is one that shall be monitored because CONSEA shall regularly meet and hold the government accountable to make sure that the promises that are made are promises that are kept. To do this monitoring, in human rights law, we use indicators. Now, indicators um, come in three groups. We distinguish structural indicators, process indicators, and outcome indicators. And this is not a very important terminology, but what's important is that these different indicators fulfill different functions. Structural indicators serve to assess whether the government, whether the state has an adequate legal institutional policy framework. Does it have a framework law? Does it have a national action plan? Does it have independent monitoring bodies to monitor whether food security strategies are effectively being implemented? But that, of course, can remain only on paper. So you need also to examine whether these promises are being fulfilled, whether efforts are put into implementing these food security strategies, and you need process indicators to measure this. Process indicators look at public expenditures. Is enough money going into agriculture? Is enough of the budget dedicated to agriculture going to small-scale farmers? Is enough reaching women farmers farming alone? These are process indicators. But these, in turn, 
are not sufficient because you need to see whether the policies that are implemented are successful. And you have to look at the outcomes. Are we making progress? Is hunger malnutrition being reduced? We know of many countries which have invested lots of money in agriculture, but at the same time have not managed to bridge the gap between poor farmers and rich farmers. In indeed, we know countries which have boosted their production, increased their ability to feed the population, but have at the same time seen a larger number of people becoming hungry as a result of not monitoring whether the policies were working uh, for the benefit of the poor. So we need outcome indicators that serve to assess the success of these strategies in a permanent learning process hmm, that will allow these national action plans to be permanently revised and tested against the results that they produce. These national strategies with these indicators will be uh, the major tool by which the governments shall discharge their obligations towards the right to food to respect, protect, and, and fulfill the right to food. And this approach leads, for example, parliaments to have a much more important say in the design and implementation of policies that relate to food security. For example, looking at this typology, respect, protect, fulfill, defining states' obligations in this area, parliaments can improve the framework through which the government shall be held to account if it violates the right to food. Parliaments can um, encourage the government to better control private actors, for example, um, private traders speculating on the price of food or um, um, commodity buyers abusing their dominant position in order to cheat farmers by paying too low prices for the crops that they buy from these farmers. The parliament is there to monitor governments to ensure that the government discharges its duties to respect, protect, and fulfill the right to food. And of course, parliaments can adopt framework clause uh, that will be um, the, the defining the framework through which national strategies for the right to food are being adopted. So that is the governance framework. And today we are seeing this framework increasingly used, increasingly invoked, and the right to food movement is gradually taking shape. And my role really for the Human Rights Council, for the UN General Assembly, is to promote this movement. I spent much of my time in developing countries trying to mobilize actors in order to improve the legal institutional policy frameworks I've just described, because I believe, like Amartya Sen believed 30 years ago already, that accountability, participation, empowerment are absolutely key ingredients for the success of food security strategies. Let me give you a few, a few examples. One major example is the well-known um, America Latina y el Caribe sin hambre um, initiative launched um, in 2005-2006 uh, um, for the Latin American and Caribbean continent um, with the FAO with support of the Spanish Development Cooperation Agency. This has been an extremely successful uh, movement uh, by which different countries have been with the leadership I should say of Guatemala and particularly Brazil different countries have been encouraging each other to improve the legislative policy framework to protect the right to food. And more and more, we've seen in this region framework laws being adopted, national strategies being adopted, um, more or less successful, uh, but well-intended, um, and empowering, in many cases, producers, organizations, and NGOs so that they can have a say in how agricultural policies are being shaped. In Argentina, this was the case already with a law creating a national nutrition and food program in 2003, but the developments are mostly more recent in Guatemala in 2005, in Ecuador in 2006, in Brazil 2006, I've already mentioned this law, in Venezuela in 2008, and in Nicaragua most recently in 2009. Um, we also have, in a number of these countries, the right to food mentioned in the constitutions. This was most recently the case in, in Mexico in 2011, in Brazil in 2010, and uh, earlier on in countries such as um, uh, Nicaragua, Guatemala, 
Bolivia, uh, for example. So we have the legislative constitutional policy framework improved thanks to this initiative, America y Caribe Sin Hambre. Part of this was successful because simply these countries share one common language, except for Brazil, which is of course Portuguese speaking, but all the others have Spanish in common, allowing collective learning to be speeded up. And this, I believe, was one major factor in the ability for these countries to inspire one another in adopting these frameworks. And of course, the very active role of the FAO um, under the leadership then of Jose Graziano da Silva, uh, when he was heading the regional office of the FAO for Latin America, um, was extremely important in, in, in pushing this. And today, Graziano is very much willing, I discuss with him regularly on this issue, to push this for Africa, the very same process of recognizing, implementing the right to food. One component of the Iniciativa is the Frente Parlamentario contra el hambre, a parliamentary front against hunger, which is a network of parliamentarians working in their respective countries to hold governments accountable, to adopt framework laws, to share good practices, and to support each other in order to improve the fight against hunger and malnutrition by legal and policy instruments. We are now seeing the same developing in Africa. This process is still in its, in its infancy, but for example, I convened a, a, an open, um, well, a multi-stakeholder consultation for Anglophone Africa. Uh, these um, nine countries on your map. Um, this consultation was convened in Nairobi in April this year, and I was really impressed to see how parliamentarians, national human rights commissions, NGOs, producers' organizations, the East African Farmers Federation in particular, um, and government officials and international agencies are now increasingly working in Uganda, in Kenya, in Tanzania, in Malawi, in Mozambique, to improve the legislative policy institutional framework to recognize the right to food. The means by which this is done differ very significantly from country to country. Of course, not all countries have the same institutions to begin with, and the steps they take um, do not follow one single script, obviously. Um, and even in one country, you can have different approaches that coexist. For example, take South Africa. South Africa adopted in 1994, after apartheid, a very progressive constitution, Article 27 of which recognizes uh, the right to food. And it also has various strategies, policies in place that recognize the importance of food security. Now, some are just on paper and not diligently followed upon. That's the example of the 2002 integrated food security strategy, which I could study in great detail. I was in South Africa uh, last summer. Disappointing in how it's implemented, but it's there. It can be invoked. It is a way to direct funding towards the needs of the most food insecure segments of the population, uh, but more needs to be done, clearly. But we have other things developing in South Africa. For example, courts, based on the right to food, may strike down measures that violate the rights of the most food insecure segments of the population. For example, small-scale fishers were not taken into account in this um, Marine Living Resource Act that was meant to allocate quotas across fishers, the needs of small-scale farmers, artisanal farmers, was not, were not taken into account. And the Equality Court had to intervene to say, look, these farmers will lose their livelihoods if their views are not sought and taken into account. So as a result, most recently, about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, a new act was adopted. The small-scale fisheries policy was adopted in order to take into account the requirements of the right to food. Um, in other cases, strategies are adopted that are monitored by non-judicial means. For example, um, in 2010, the South African government chose to make a priority to have vibrant, equitable, and sustainable rural communities and food security for all. And this is monitored by um, a sort of um, internal monitoring of performance department within the South African government that holds ministers accountable for the results that they achieve. A last example, and I will close uh, uh, almost with this, uh, Schengen, is, um, is the role of courts in a country such as India. 
In India, since 10 years, you have a case developing before the Indian courts called the Right to Food case. It began with the um, uh, litigation launched by an NGO, the People's Union for Civil Liberties, against the Indian states who were not adequately implementing laws that obliged the local municipalities to deliver food to populations starving using the food reserves that municipalities have to have under the famine acts adopted under in the colonial period. And since 10 years, you have some 70 court orders delivered by the Supreme Court of India that are monitored by commissioners of the court, mandated by the Supreme Court to examine whether there's no corruption, discrimination in the way these um, acts are being implemented. For example, here this picture shows a representative of the NGO PUCL working with the commissioner of the court in a village in, um, in Bihar, one of the poorest states of India, and they look at the school meal program, looking, if, looking at the resources available and how these resources were spent and whether they were spent in the right way, implementing the order of the Supreme Court of India. Let me close with one last remark, and I won't look at global governance that will lead us too far, too long. One last remark concerning development, development cooperation. I believe that development cooperation is, um, has much to benefit from also using a right to food approach. Now, there are many texts that show the usefulness of a human rights based approach to development cooperation. I will, I will pass on those and I will, uh, because it's a bit abstract the way it's formulated. I will say the following. We have, you're familiar, right, with these names and figures and, right? even book covers, right? Um, right, so I like this kind of polar opposition between two parts of Manhattan because I, I think it's, it's fun to work with. And of course, we all know both are wrong, right? Uh, um, some because they believe big pushers are, you know, the magic bullet and others because they believe, uh, um, as very provocatively Bill Easterly says, um, the, 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 the poor have markets, uh, sorry, the poor have bureaucrats and the rich have markets and we should leave it to, you know, the market mechanism to, to, to work. Uh, this is a very polemical approach um, in his uh, white man's burden um, uh, that Bill Easterly takes to these issues. Now, what I would like to say here is that a rights-based approach is one that is um, a sort of third way between these opposites of you know, uh, top-down technocratic planning and big pushes and the bottom-up um, searchers versus planners, um, market incentives-based uh, ways of reducing um, uh, poverty and, and hunger. And this is so because the right to food um, is one that is empowering. It's one that is rewarding participation, one that encourages to focus on the most vulnerable and therefore makes the poor actors of the policies from which they should benefit allowing these policies to be better informed, better monitored, better assessed and better implemented, and also more legitimate and better understood by those who should benefit. And frankly, having spent some time studying um, the literature on this issue, including the, the you know, the, I think very rice-based without using the term um, a book by, by Banerjee and, and Duflo most recently on these issues, I'm convinced that a rights-based approach to development cooperation has much to offer allowing us to move to a supply-driven approach where we provide things to a demand-driven approach where we ask people what they most urgently need by involving them in designing the solutions that fit them best. Moving from a situation in which governments speak uh, across populations to a triangular relationship in which civil society, the beneficiaries of support, are involved in designing policies that should help them. Moving from a charity-based approach to providing support to an entitlement-based uh, approach in which people are given rights that they can claim, which is not just empowering, which is also a way to ensure that they will themselves monitor whether the money goes in the right place. Moving from a focus on where efficiency gains are most, where the quick gains, gains can be achieved, to an approach where you focus on the needs of the most vulnerable groups, the small farmers working on the most marginal soils who often are not supported because you cannot make them immediately productive entrepreneurs. And so it's not interesting for governments to invest in them. 
But if we were to focus on the most vulnerable, we would also pay attention to them and not just to better off farmers working in green basket regions. And finally, a rights-based approach is one in which assessment will not be made unilaterally by those providing the support by the donors, but it will be made involving the beneficiaries to understand what their concerns are, where they feel they have not been well served by the policies meant to support them in order to improve these policies permanently. And I'm now working on how development cooperation could benefit more from using the right to food as a, a, a way to improve the, the effectiveness of how these policies deliver uh, for the poor. That is um, um, Schengen, ladies and gentlemen, um, what I would like to say on the right to food, and I, I really welcome your questions and, and your support in this enterprise.